So um, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me, um, uh, let me make a couple of disclaimers. So I am rather jet lagged. So I think this morning it will be fine. This is a disclaimer for this afternoon in case I were even too tired to make the disclaimer this afternoon. Um, so I'll try to do my best, but um, I got here last night. Um, the second thing I would like to say is that um, I like questions very much. So it allows me to see where you're at. Um, I think it helps, you know, the flow of the lecture. And in particular, it gives me a minute to breathe while I'm tired. So I welcome uh, questions during the lecture. Okay. So what am I going to do? Um, <clears throat> so what I would like to do, of course, I'm going to start with an introduction. I'm going to give a very biased um, int historic introduction of what I want to do. Um, and the goal of this set of lectures is to present Price's rectifiability theorem. So what, what is that? I can state it very easily. You have a radon measure. Um, this radon measure has a density. Don't worry, I will describe each one of the terms. And you want to prove some regularity about this measure. Why did I decide to do this? Because this is a piece of GMT that is not, that although is a very, introduces very powerful tools, I believe is not very well understood, is not in general very well treated, and I think there's a wealth of ideas that is worth learning about and being able to use them. So my goal is to present a good outline of the proof that if you ever are interested in going to read the paper, you know what to find there and have kind of you know, a roadmap of how to read it. If there's time at the end, meaning on Friday, I will present a series of works in different areas that use these ideas. They're not exactly corollaries of the work presented, but where the sort of ideas that I have introduced have been presented. Some of them come from geometric measure theory. Some of them come from free boundary regularity problems. Okay, but so that will depend on how we're doing on time on um, on Friday. Okay, so <clears throat> I am. Um, so I'm, as I said, I'm going to do a very, very um, biased, historic uh, approach to these. And I'm going to start by, I'm going to start in roughly 1928, 1929 with Bessie Kovitch, who I consider for the side of the GMT that I'm going to present, the father of GMT. Okay, so what was Besikovic working on? And maybe I should say, let's remember where we were. So this is 1929, um, it's Europe, and internet didn't exist. And I say this because although internet didn't exist for lots of us when we were your age, for you, since internet has been there all the time, you, don't re you cannot even imagine how things were before it existed. So what didn't exist? The archive didn't exist. Okay, actually planes, the way we travel was different. So when somebody did something, you know, in the, in the Soviet Union or in Russia before, it was, the results were not known two or three days later, you know, anywhere else in Europe, forget the US. Okay, but we're going to be in Europe for a while. And so even though, um, in some sense, Hausdorff had defined Hausdorff measure, well, Basikovich wasn't quite aware of it, and so he defined his linear measure. What happened is Lebesgue had been able to prove, let's go to R, let's look at Lebesgue differentiation theorem, what does it tell you? So Lebesgue introduced, you, you know, you have the length, of course, everybody knew what the length was, but Lebesgue allowed you to measure things that were not necessarily segments. And um, what the first thing Besikovic wanted to do is said, okay, I have things that look like things that come from R that are one dimensional, whatever that means, and I want to measure them. So he, and he defined this linear measure, which is actually the whole Hausdorff measure. So is in this, I'm going to state that using the Hausdorff measure. So here is what Besikovic was looking at. So all the work I mentioned from Besikovic was done in this period of 
time. And so he was looking at the following thing. He had a, you, you use another color? another color. Yes. <laughs> That white is, yes, I'll use another one. We'll see if it works. OK. But is that, you know, Giovanni got the board dirty in this <laughs> past wire. <laughs> 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 no, but, you know, not now, but, you know. <laughs> no, actually, he has a way stronger right hand than me. That's the problem. OK. Is that better? Or that? OK. So x in R2, and he said, OK, I have a set that has this property. The Hausdorff measured is finite and positive. What can I say about it? So you actually saw in Giovanni's, at the end of Giovanni's talk, an example of such a f set. That, that set that he drew is called the four corner Cantor set. And so apparently you cannot say anything because that looked relatively bad. Well, what Besikovich did is said, well, you can write it as a union of two things where y is one rectifiable. And I will change a little bit the definition that um, Giovanni gave earlier today. And then I'll show you is exactly the same. But the, for the purposes of my talk, I need to have the other definition. So, y is one rectifiable and z is purely, and I'll tell you what these mean, one unrectifiable, purely unrectifiable. And so what does this mean? It means that I, h1, and I'll tell you who everybody is in a minute, of pi l of z equals 0 for almost every L and pi L is the projection from R2, the orthogonal projection into the line L. Okay, your first question should be, what do you mean by almost every? Well, in here I'm gonna cheat. L is a line, a line in R2 is the same thing as a direction. You could take Hausdorff measured on S1, that's it, okay? so. You have two sets. So if you have a set of finite H1 measure, finite and positive, there's a one, a rectifiable piece, and a purely unrectifiable piece. And what you should keep in mind, what's purely unrectifiable? The four corner Cantor set. And as Giovanni pointed out, basically, he, um, he showed that in almost every direction, by when he intersected with this graph and projected, into almost every direction where you project, you project to a set of measure zero. And there are only four directions in which you don't, which were the four, which was this one and the four and the other three that are exactly the same. Don't worry, I'll draw that set again because it gives a, a beautiful example of, um, <clears throat> of many things. Okay. So this was the first thing Feder the Besikovich did. I will tell you what he did afterwards, but now I'm going to jump because it makes a lot of sense. At this point, not only H1 had been defined, but Hn. So what happens if you're not in R2? That's not too complicated. But what happens if you're in um, an Rm and the same thing holds for n? So now we go to Feder. Um, so for those of you taking notes, I want to point out that, so what I noticed, and I haven't seen Josh's notation, for Giovanni, n was the ambient dimension, d was the dimension of the set he cares about. Sorry, we did not agree on these. For me, m is the ambient dimension, n is the dimension of the set I care about. And if I try to change, there will be mistakes everywhere. The way I've planned it, there's only mistake every so often, but this, so we're gonna, I'm gonna keep my notation, I'm sorry. Okay, so suppose x lives in Rm, and we have and n is an integer, okay? 
I know what if I write n, we all think n is an integer, but you'll see why I say that later. Then what Federer proved, the question was, OK, here we go. This is the extension of Besicovich theorem. What Federer did is he did exactly the same thing, except that it took him a few years. I'll explain why. Y, Z, where Y is n rectifiable. And Z is n purely n purely n unrectifiable, which means exactly the same thing, i.e., h n of phi l of z equals zero for almost every l n plane. And so these almost every has to do with the harm measured on the Grassmannian. If you don't know what that means, don't worry too much. It means that I can put a right measure on the set of n planes in Rm. And pi L is, of course, the orthogonal projection. OK. OK, the first remark. I like to make is that there was, of course, th there's a, I said, you know, we were far away. So, but here it wasn't that Federer was not aware of Besicovich, is that to prove it, he needed to introduce a lot of different machinery that was not, that, you know, Besicovich didn't need to um, do. In fact, Besicovich's arguments are remarkable. Most of the things are done by hand. OK, so one of the questions that had bugged lots of people in GMT for a long time is whether you could prove Federer's theorem by using Besicovich and slicing. OK, so I don't know if when did you do the co-area or just the area formula? OK, <laughs> don't worry. No, I don't need it. It's just an example. But what you could imagine is that if you're an H in a higher dimension and then you slice, OK, and you only look at the slice, you will have the same property. And if you slice enough, you're going to land there. And people for a long time tried that argument. And only in the late 90s was Brian White able to come up with a different proof of Feather's structure theorem using Besicovich and slicing. OK, so that's just, um, just because lots of people tried. Everybody believed it was true, but it took a long time to come up with the correct argument. OK, so even though um, Giovanni gave a definition of rectifiable, for the reason that will become apparent shortly after, I want to give a slightly different definition. It's not that we disagree. It's that for the cases he's going to look at, Josh is going to look at, and most of the ones I'm going to look at, they're the same. But I also would like to point out that there's one case we're not the same, and that's why I, I want to do that. OK. So what's my definition? So I'm going to give you, I, um, maybe I shouldn't say this. So one of the things I don't like when I do a mini course is that, or a course, is that you need to spend a lot of time giving definitions, because I think it's makes the thing dry and boring. But on the other hand, they're the basic rules. I came, um, I went through a French system. That's how I learned math. And I do recall deeply the Bourbaki style with every single definition. <laughs> so <laughs> it's funny to have an allergic reaction to it here where I learned it. But you know, that's, uh, that's life. So, but I need a number of definitions. So although I'm guessing all of you know perfectly well what a Lipschitz map is, let me just say it for once, unless you did it, well, even if they did it yesterday. So, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you my definition of rectifiability. So definition, a Lipschitz map f from Rn into Rm is something that satisfies, satisfies There exists L positive such that f of x minus f of y is less than L x minus y. Two, so 
E in Rn, for me, Rm is n rectifiable if E can be written, can, is contained in a countable union of Lipschitz images of Rn and a set of measure zero. Okay, so where Hn of E0 is zero, is zero and Fi from Rn into Rm is Lipschitz. Okay, so let me first say how this is exactly the same thing Giovanni wrote. Okay? So what he wrote, except that I am not making that basic assumption, because that basic assumption makes the difference between some things I'm going to say later. That basic assumption when he said that we, always, that we assume Hn of E, Hn restricted to E is locally finite, is because the theory without it is a different theory. And it's a very, it's something that's not well understood. I'll, I'll emphasize that. But so I won't, that will not be my assumption. Okay, well, soon it will be, but not yet. Okay, so what did he write? He wrote E, so it was written over there. If I had planned better, I would have left it. E equals a union of E sub i's, where the E sub i's were included inside a C1 submanifold. User union a set of measures zero. Okay? First of all, he could have written E sub i, you agree that, so let me start with the definition that E is a union of images of Lipschitz pieces. Let me assume, how, let me show you how I go from here to his definition, and then hopefully we'll will be fine that they're the same one, okay? If I am a Lipschitz, if I am Lipschitz, Radama, um, Whitney's extension, Whitney's theorem tells you that a Lipschitz function co coincides with a C1 function basically almost everywhere. Not exactly almost everywhere, but every time I am on a set, on a big ball, if I have a Lipschitz function, it corresponds, it coincides with a C1 function, except on a very small piece. Okay? So basically, you can exhaust every Lipschitz function by C1 functions. Okay? And you end up throwing some things on the zero set over here. Okay? Notice he said you also need to make this rigorous that every Lipschitz map defined on a small piece can be enlarged to a Lipschitz map over all of Rn. That's, you can extend Lipschitz functions nicely, okay? So these two definitions are the same. I just need this one, okay? Questions? Do you have a question? Uh, yes. Nope. No. Yeah. It would be lovely, but no. Okay. That, that gives you a different theory. <laughs> okay. So they, they, they grow, they can grow as much as they want. Okay. And, you know, because I, I'm really cheating, because, you know, it looks very nice because Fi is, this is inside the Fi of Rn, but you should think that my rectifiable set can be full of holes. Okay. So it only touches a few pieces of. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, <clears throat> what I would like um, to do now is, in order to to frame a little bit better Besikovic's next question, I want to go back to Giovanni's example of the four-cornered Cantor set and talk, talk to you a little bit more about some of the properties, some additional properties of this set. So let me go back. So 
the four-cornered Cantor set, which was the example he just um, constructed, satisfies this property. And if that were the x, in particular, there y is nobody, and z is the whole thing. Okay, but. So you all have in mind the construction of the four-corner Cantor set. So we call it C. Let's see with the four-corner Cantor set. So the properties we saw was that H1 of C is finite and positive. It's purely unrectifiable. But moreover, if we had looked more carefully, here is another property. For every x in C, and for every r, basically between 0 and 1, the following thing is true. You take h1 of C intersection B of xr. You divide it. So there exists, I should have said, there exists a constant kappa, positive such that if you take h1 of c intersection the ball of center x and radius r and you divide by r, this is bounded above and below by kappa and kappa minus 1. Okay, So it's not only that at each point that the set is of positive and finite measure, but at each point the measure grows linearly, like if it were a nice curve. OK, so now let me tell you what the other question Besikovich had. So as I said, let's go back to Lebesgue differentiation theorem in R, you know, the very, very basic thing. So the very basic theorem tells you, let's take a, and I agree with Giovanni, all sets are Borel here. Let's take a Borel set. Okay. In R, you look of positive measure, and you look at H1. H1 is Lebesgue measure, but it's the same. H1 of E intersection B of XR. So, of course, I'm going to use. I'm, I'm going to write something else here in a minute. But so, let's assume we are simply. I'm going to put other things there. So, if you're taking notes, leave space. You take a set E. Think of it in R for now. I'll change the rules of the game in a second. You take the ball of center x and radius r, which if you're in R just is the interval x minus r, x plus r. You divide over 2r. And you let the limit as r goes to 0. You know that this gives you 1 for almost every point in E. Okay? That was Lebesgue differentiation theorem. So what Besikovich asks is the following question. So Besikovich. Same period. So let E be in R2 such that for H1 almost every x in E. OK? What can you say about E? OK. okay. So and I should say, let me, sorry, otherwise. <laughs> OK. So remember, let's go over there. If h1 of e is positive and finite, you can decompose it into those two pieces, y and z. The z is kind of bad looking because, look, the four-corner Cantor set was your example. This tells you that the limb sup and the limb inf 
of these expressions are positive and finite. On the other hand, it doesn't tell you that the limit exists. And in fact, what the key point of this story, what Besikovich proved, is that if you have these, then E is one rectifiable. Remembered here where in the 1930s. OK? So basically, he told you, if you have these, well, the z part is not there. And so two questions immediately come to mind. What happens if we change, if we're not in two? So the question is, what if E lives in Rm and we have star 1 replaced by the correct start n. Let, we'll, we'll talk about what that is in a minute. OK? And what if, rather than looking at these very specific, what this tells you is that h1 restricted to e satisfies what Giovanni called the basic assumption, the locally finite. If it's finite, it's locally finite. What happens if we look at a regular measure, which is just locally finite? And I assume that exists. So here it is. Really, the question that I would like to talk about for the whole week. And of course, I'm going to give you the punchline early on. So, you know. I'm going to kill the suspense, but hopefully in the technique, there's enough suspense. So um, let me I'm recall mu in Rm is Radon. If it's Borel regular, and mu of k is finite for every k compact in Rm. OK? Your favorite example is the mass that Joshi defined yesterday. OK? And that's what. So we say that for the mu rod on in Rm, the n density at x exists. So this is the definition. If the following thing, theta of n mu x, so the limit, so if this limit, the limit as r goes to 0, of mu of b of xr over r to the n. So this, this, what I am saying is this limit exists. The fact that I write limit means the limit exists. OK? If this um, limit exists. OK? And so the question, let me see if I have another color so I can put the question here. So what did Besikovich ask? So with this, <coughs> with this language, what Besikovich asked if mu is h1 restricted to e, and the density exists almost everywhere. He put it constant, but that's, because that's what the right assumption was. Um, and the density exists. What can you say about the set? What we are going to try to answer, what, pri what the, the question we want to look at, question, mu radon, and theta and mu x exist, and it's positive and finite, 
mu almost everywhere, what can you say about mu? So that's what I would like I would like to talk about basically for this. So what can we before before I start telling you the history, let's think for a minute what can we what can we expect to say? Okay, Wh what sort of questions are we really asking? Okay? So Besikovich proved that if Basically, what Wesikovich answered is he said, if mu is H1 restricted to E, and then you can prove that the set E is one rectifiable. Okay? So when we have a Radon measure, What do we have as this? I mean, we don't have a set E to start with. So what exactly can we, what exactly are we asking? Okay. So what I would like to do is first give you a definition <coughs> and then give you, so I'm going to give you a definition of a measure being rectifiable. In an awkward way, I'm going to put a name with this definition. I'm going to tell you the story. And then I'm going to give you a different definition of rectifiability that was given by somebody else. And we'll see the differences. And I mean, it's, and I, I am, I'm going to do that, not because I'm going to focus on the two, but to show that there are differences, that very subtle things can make differences, and that maybe in that other definition that I'm not going to touch, there's a wealth of information that we just don't know how to handle yet. OK? So let me, let me before, so what can we expect to say? So which one do I push? Yeah, there's no algorithm that makes it work well. I, uh, okay. No, no one that I could find, but OK. So let's see. So I know I cover everything, but don't worry. I'll I'll rewrite some of it. So first, let me give you a definition. This is a definition of the rectifiability of a measure. So you saw what rectifiability of a set means. I want to tell you what rectifiability of a measure is. And this is the definition of rectifiability of a measure due to Matila and Price. Mu, okay, run on in Rm. Mu is n rectifiable if mu is absolutely continuous with respect to Hn. Is white okay or is white not okay? You prefer yellow or white is okay? Okay. And mu of Rm minus a countable union of Lipschitz images of Rn equals zero, where, so I'm just writing in math of Lipschitz. So this is telling you that the measure theoretic support of mu is a rectifiable set, and that mu is absolutely continuous with respect to H. Okay. Okay. So let me tell you the story. 
And so, for those of you who are, so I'm going to make a comment that for those of you who are seeing this for the first time, it's, it makes no sense. But for those of you who have been thinking about it for a while, uh, it might make some sense. So if you've been doing, if you've been in this business for a while, you might have noticed that every time when we do standard GMT and we prove rectifiability, you know, my definition says, and there's a Lipschitz image, and we always show that we have a Lipschitz graph. And you agree Lipschitz images and Lipschitz graphs are not the same thing. I mean, there's no implicit function theorem for Lipschitz things. Okay? So in this context, under this assumption, the two things are the same. But as you will see in a little bit by an example that I'm going to show you, if we don't assume something like that, they're not the same. But what happens is that if uh, at least you learn GMT coming from where I came, which was from the um, geometric side, from the purely variational side, the measures you have are always absolutely continuous with respect to HN. And then everybody is the same. Okay. Okay. If that comment didn't make any sense for you, just erase it. This was a commercial. You, you know. Okay. Let's go back. So what I'm going to do down is I'm going to give you the history of the problem. Okay? So, we started, we have two types of measures. We have the measure, so we're going to assume HN restricted to E here and mu here. Okay? So, here mu is read on. Here HN restricted to E is locally finite, which means that it's read on. Okay? And we live always in RM. So, n equals 1, m equals 2, 1930s, Besikovic proof, e 1 rectifiable. Okay? Let me get the numbers correct. Okay, I know it did on a line, but 1944 here. And this is Morse and Randolph. N equals 1, N equals 2, mu 1 rectifier. OK? Um, 1950. Very upset. Um, 1961. So clearly, one was easy. Well, easy, so to speak. N equals 2M3 or higher, 3. Then E2 rectifiable. 75. And then 1975. Ma huh? Uh, no, sorry. No, Marsh trend. Yeah, Feather did something, but Feather did the other thing. I, I, I don't want to mention Feather. This was Marsh trend. Marsh trend also did uh, something that we will deal, we'll talk about this afternoon. Okay? And Matila proof now. N E N and N E M. Of course, M is bigger than N E and rectifiable. Tatiana, your assumption is the density is one Oh, here the density. Sorry, the density exists. Of course, if the density exists, the density is one in this case, almost everywhere for the sets. 
not for those. Sorry, thank you. The assumption on top of there is theta n of mu x exists, thank you, mu almost everywhere. And here, this is the mu I'm talking about. And if this one exists almost everywhere, it's one almost everywhere. OK. And so what this course is going to be about is the following result, 1987 price proves that for any n in any n, mu is n rectifiable. OK? The methods of proof are completely different for each case, or they are? Yeah, it's very. So, um, so some of them I'm ignorant, okay? So these ones, these ones, what they try to do is they model Besikovich. What did Besikovich do? Besikovich got their approxies, approximating lines and drew his graphs, okay? They try to do something similar, okay? Matila, Marstrand, it's interesting because Marshall was trying to do something else, which I want to talk about this afternoon that relates to the, so he didn't quite blow up, okay? And I will tell you what that is, but he almost did, okay? So, and then Matila was the first one to, to blow up. I, I'll explain what this is. And then the reason why this, this is absolutely different. And what he introduced the notion of a tangent, um, measure, which is the generalization of what Giovanni didn't have a chance to say this morning, <laughs> but since we all saw it, now I will be very, don't worry, I will define that very careful. He defined tangent measures. He understood, so I'm, I'm running a little bit ahead, but just to answer your question, let's, what on earth is happening here? Le looking at the limit of R, so let me rewrite the density. What does it mean? exist and is, you know, in zero infinity. Limit as r goes to zero. So the condition we are putting is this one. This number exists. This is an infinitesimal condition. This is telling you something of, is getting very small. So what you need to do is blow up, okay? And so, what price is, is he's blo he blew up, he understood those blow ups, he classified those blow ups, and that's how he proved it. Okay? Um, for those of you who might be coming from more from metric geometry and are trying to think, oh, can I generalize these? In all of what I'm going to say, it's very, 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 very important that the balls are round. Okay? If I go to Rn, Okay, you, you can think of it. Look, <laughs> I have a, a measure metric space. I can write these. So R2 is a measure metric space with where the ball, when I put the max as the norm. So these are my balls. And the same theorem there is, is very difficult. It's different. For Rn with that me metric, it exists. But we are going to very, very much use the fact that the balls are round. You know, one doesn't think of that, but that's important. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I said I put a yellow and orange thing on that, on that um, condition. I said something. So here is what happened. So I had, and maybe, this is a good time to, to explain how I got into this. So um, maybe I'm not there yet. So let me, let me tell you what happened. So I had been working, and I'll explain at some point why, with this definition of rectifiability. And then one of my 
former students came, Matthew Badger came and told me, oh, we can prove the following thing about the measure. And I said, wait a second, but that doesn't make sense in the context that, and things, oh, it's because you're thinking of that definition of rectifiability. But if you go and look at Federer, so that's the definition of the 70s and 80s, okay? Federer is from before, it's from the 60s. So Federer in his book has the following definition of rectifiability. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write the definition and I'm gonna, we're gonna take a three minute break, okay? So you can think about the definition and go out if you need to. And then we'll see how different they are, okay? So let me give you the definition. So another definition of rectifiability. And this one, so why am I doing this? Because I would really love to know what Federer had in mind when he did this. Because if you, if you look at Federer, Federer never wrote anything without something in mind. My guess is that he really understood something that maybe he had something in mind that we haven't seen yet. And so, okay, so what was a measure, what did mean so for Federer? Let me be but don't, don't worry, I'm going to stop finishing. Uh, after this, I will never again write. We'll, we'll always have a write-on measure. Uh, Rn, and he said mu is n rectifiable if mu of Rn minus the union equals zero. And so again, Fi here's are from Rn into Rn. So if you look at it, it's the same thing except for that, uh, that box, orange box that I indicated. Okay, so let's take a two, three minute break and I will love the, what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna show you an example by Garnett, Kilip, and Schul that show you the extent to which this is different from that, okay? Hopefully it will be a disturbing example that we'll bring you back to. I know, it's almost lunch time, but okay. Let me give you this example that shows not only the fact that these two things are different, but really the power of that condition over there. So this example is brand new. I mean, it's, you know, four, three, four years old. And so is Garnett, Kilip, and Shul. And here is what the example is. So they construct, there exists mu radon. I'll try to tell you how you construct it, but rather on in Rm such that here are all the properties. One, so let me define the support of mu is the set of points x in Rm such that mu of b of x of r is positive for every r. This is a closed set. That's the Okay, so because we're all biased, we are thinking this measure is fat because its support is all of our n. Two, mu is one rectifiable. Okay, so let me emphasize n here, so the support of mu it should have them. And some, which is a closed set, I was given a definition. The support of mu is all of our m. I want to choose m bigger than or equal than 2, so, so let me, let me, this is, all right, Tatiana. Equals our m. This is a closed set. Mu is one rectifiable. Okay, one. Um, Three, for those of you who like the peculiarities of mu, mu is doubling. 
Let me tell you what that means. It means that there exists a constant C positive such that mu of B of X to R is less than C of mu of B of XR. For every X in the support, that means every X in RM, and for every R positive. Okay? Huh? Oh. Uh, in which one? In which one could it be? In, in, thank you. Now, in, in Federer's sense, because it's singular with respect to H1. Okay? Federer, let me, you, I was about to give it to you. U is singular with respect to H1. Its density is locally, it is, plus infinity everywhere. And I want to say something else for five. Given any Lipschitz graph, I'm going to write it, OK? So a Lipschitz graph is I have a function r into r m minus 1 and the graph Lipschitz, so i.e. Lipschitz. And graph of u is a set of points <coughs> x, u of x. So I'm going to call this gamma x in R. So this is a very special type of Lipschitz image, OK? It's a Lipschitz graph. But look what happens. Mu of any of these guys is 0. OK? OK, I'll tell you what the f who it is in a minute. Um, Only with respect to the default uh, coordinates. Uh, yeah, yes, but uh, really, no, no. It, it, I should have put any line and any, yeah, any graph, any one graph. Okay. Yeah. This is yeah. Um, between four and five. Yes, of course. Yeah, but but it's more if you so what do I want to what do I want to emphasize? Yes, there is a rel I mean of but it's a weird thing if you think of it because look what this is saying. So it's one rectifiable. Maybe I'm gonna rewrite what that means. Mu of Rm minus the union of Lipschitz images is zero. So we could, so what does this mean? I'm going to speak in English and it's not mathematically correct. But this tells you that Rm, that mu is supported, it's the wrong use of the word support, in countably many Lipschitz images. Okay? This is one example of where the Lipschitz image, this is a special type of Lipschitz image. Okay? Yes, exactly. So this guy is concentrated on these Lipschitz images, but doesn't see any single Lipschitz graph. Okay, so these Lipschitz images are, you know, are the filling the space. I'm going to tell you in a minute how you construct the measure. Don't worry. Okay, so this is an example where the two things are not the same. Rectifiability, price, Matilda, and rectifiability, Federer are different things. Clearly. Federer allows for lots of pathology because the what, so what they were looking for, what was interesting to them, this was something they realized afterwards. But what they really wanted was to construct a measure in R2 that was supported in all of R2 but was, was basically concentrated on Lipschitz graphs. Okay, that's the example they wanted to. So let me tell you how you construct it. I won't do all the construction, of course. Here is what you do. You take the this is one. You divide it into three pieces, equal length. OK? They're equal length. But you associate different masses. You say this one measures epsilon, this one measures epsilon, and this one measures 1 minus epsilon. 
and then two epsilon, thank you. And then you do the same thing, okay? And so here, this measures epsilon squared, epsilon squared, epsilon squared, epsilon squared. This is going to be the basis of my construction, 1 minus 2 epsilon squared. And here you have an epsilon, 1 minus 2 epsilon, epsilon, 1 minus 2 epsilon, and so on. And then you keep up. Now, this is your basic. So think of what Giovanni did when he had the four-corner counter set and, and he took away sums. We keep all of the squares. We weigh them differently. And now we repeat this picture inside each of them. Okay? And you keep on going. And the limit of that measure is, is measured over here. Okay. So the paper, this paper is not complicated to read. If you're curious, I mean, it's an interesting thing. Okay. So, so this hopefully shows that there's what is failing is the orange box. Okay. So from now on, when I talk about rectifiability of measure, I mean. Matila and Price. I wanted to illustrate these because I actually really would love to know what Federer had in mind. There's recent work trying to characterize rectifiability for these measures. It's rather difficult. Um, some work has been done by Badger and Schul in the one-dimensional case. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. No, 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 it plays, it plays an important role. Because re think of it, if you chose epsilon equal to one-third, then you'll be constructing the four-corner canter set. So you need an epsilon, I don't remember, the epsilon needs to be small. Yes, it doesn't depend on the step on the construction. There are other finer properties of the measure that depend on the epsilon, but not the ones that are put on the board. Okay. But for sure, less than one third. Huh? Isn't the critical epsilon one half? If I put, but if I put one third, one third, one third, you see, I just construct the big measure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm gonna be honest. I I also have one half in mind, but I recall this for something else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So do you mean uh, if we assume this uh, epsilon continues, then there does not exist a radial measure which uh, somehow fits in with uh, this this function and this this graph. This 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 right. Yes. In what sense? Is that something we, I can prove? Yes, I can prove. Has somebody written it as a theorem? Uh, no, it appears hidden in many places. OK? But the way it's proven is not that you take your Lipschitz graph. It's, it's not that you take your Lipschitz map, and then you do the inverse function theorem, the implicit function theorem. You take that definition of rectifiability. You apply your machinery. In particular, you show what an approximate, that it has approximate tangent planes in the way that Giovanni is going to define tomorrow. And you prove. <laughs> and you can then construct the graphs. How do the graphs relate to the functions? <laughs> I have no idea. But you can change them by functions. You can, if you have that, you can change mapping by function. But it doesn't mean that I take this guy and I replace it by a function. Okay, by a graph. Okay, so what from now on, now that I've you know, kind of created this mess, introduced two dimensions of rectifiability of a measure and stuff, we forget about Federer as much as we can and we go to Price and Matilda. Okay, so that's a rectifiable measure. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about.
from now on I won't say it anymore. Okay. And so the questions I would like to ask is, are there conditions that guarantee that a measure is unrectifiable? Okay. Clearly the density does. Okay. If we have time on Friday, I would like to show that the density ratio, and in particular, not only the density ratio, but the density ratio, which is not, not only the density, but the ratio, this number here encodes more information than rectifiability. Namely, that if we put some conditions on that, we can recover conditions of smooth, uh, smoothness so, um, properties. And one thing that, you know, it's funny how, because we were going to rectifiability and everything is defined in terms of uh, Lipschitz images of our n, and when we think of our n, of course, we're talking about an integer. But I could have defined that thing over there, th this thing just here, with an n that's not an integer. And I could have asked what happens, my non-integers as I'm going to call them s, what happens when the s density exists almost everywhere? And that we will talk about this afternoon. Okay? That will explain why we only look at um, integer n's. Okay. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on price. And now let's think. As I said, this box here is an infinitesimal property. I don't know. So if you were a grad student in the US, you will have had the chance and the pleasure to teach calculus many, many times. And um, I will ask you to go back to, and I'm sure you've, some of you might have, let's go, is an infinitesimal property. When, you're, when we teach our students um, in calculus, when you're trying to think of and what's the first infinitesimal property that comes up, whether the function is differentiable or not? And what's the intuition for differentiability? And what do students do? Maybe, again, I'm going to take the students I teach. You ask them if a function is differentiable. They take their graph and calculate it out. They plot it. And they start doing like this to enlarge it. And if the thing ends up being a line, they say it's differentiable. And if it's not a line, they say it's not differentiable or my calculator is not working because they assume that every function you give them is differentiable. Okay. So what is that process? We're trying to recover infinitesimal properties. What we do is you plot. Now we have our set. We have our measure. We do this, means we enlarge, and we look at the fine properties. So what we need to talk about is the tangent measures. And what the tangent measure is, is like the tangent line is to the graph of a function in R. OK? So to talk about the tangent measures, I need to talk about what happens when we have, we're going to have sequences of measures. And we need to, so the first thing I'm going to remind you, I don't know if you, my guess is that you saw this yesterday, but just in case, I'm going to remind you what it means to have weak convergence. Did you do weak convergence yesterday? One of them. Weak convergence of measures? OK. So you talked about weak convergence of measures, and you talk about one compactness theorem. I don't know if it's the same or not. I'm going to talk about one compactness theorem. Since if I had been here, I would have known. But um, So I'm going to do it very briefly. I'm going to assume these are things that you know. But just so recall, So from now on, so I save time, all my measures are run on, and they all live in Rn. OK? So. Even though I don't write, mu i and mu, they're read on. And we say that mu i converges weakly to mu if for every f continues with compact support in our m, m <coughs> the integral of f i d mu converges to the integral, sorry, f d mu i, f d mu. And compactness theorem, how do you know if 
them for about our measures. Let's assume you have a sequence of measures, mu sub i, such that you took the soup of mu i of k is finite for every k compact. So these notations, when I put two, C, two inclusions, means k compact, OK? Then there exists a subsequence such that mu i k converges weakly to mu, and mu is rather. OK? So that's our basic um, compactness theorem. And so I'm assuming you saw this one. One of the things I will do, um, I don't know, either tomorrow or Thursday, and one of the things that's very useful in price is that he metrized this convergence, and he made the space of Radon measured into a complete metric space, and so he uses that. And now, let me tell you what a tangent measure is. Sorry. Sorry, Giovanni. Since you didn't get the chance to do it now, I get to introduce my notation. I hope it coincides with yours, more or less. <laughs> well, OK. <laughs> OK. So I want to talk about tangent measures. But to talk about tangent measures, the first thing I need to do is I need to dilate. Sorry about that. So. I am going to talk about the following map. So what does this map do? Take a point. So what's the point of these? I take, what does this do? We take A, has a little radius. And what this map does, it maps it into 0, 1. OK? This is your dilation. And now here is my definition of T A R mu. I don't know why I decided to write it like that this time. Sometimes this appears as mu of A R. But anyway, let me tell you, this is a measure. Let me tell you who it is. It's mu of R E plus A. And let me tell you who R E plus A is. Is what you imagine it is, is the point R x plus a where x is in e. And what this does, so that mu of a r of b of 0, 1 is just mu of b of r a. OK? And I'm, now, let me define a tangent measure. Definition. Let mu be right on for the ones. Otherwise, well, let mu be a measure. So all my measures are Borel. We'll say that nu is a tangent measure to mu at a if, now let me choose, I'm going to choose it right on and so I don't, if nu is right on, I don't take, it's not identically equal to 0, OK? So zeros are not good tangents. They're not tangents by my definition. OK? And there exist sequences, CIs. CI is positive. And RIs, RI going to 0, such that CI, T of A, RI, mu. OK? So this measure, when I do it with RI and A, this converges weakly 
to new a zygote. Infinity. Okay? And the set of tangent measures is denoted by tangent mu, um, tangent measures of A, is denoted by tangent mu. What should your first question be? Yeah, CI is a sequence. No, A, A is a, no, no, this is a C. A is a fixed point, okay? If you let your AI change, if you let your, your A's change, if they become AIs, this is a pseudo tangent and they behave very differently and we're not going to talk about those. They're very useful in some contexts. They're actually very, very useful if you're trying to get uniform estimates, but that's not the goal of this class. Yeah. Okay, what should be your question? Huh? Sorry, somebody said it. Do they exist? Because, you know, <laughs> remember, you should always be wary of that. I recall a um, while ago, giving these, uh, I had a paper, don't worry, no, the, the theorem was not empty, but I recall, pre decided, I, I guess I was in an awkward mood, I decided to present, I go and present this beautiful theorem, I do the proof, and then <laughs> I tell you, well, you know, and now, I mean, does anybody, I have this beautiful theorem, this, you know, does anybody satisfy this? Because, you know, it's very easy to construct these empty theories. And, well, yes, we have uh, made sure that that, but, you know, with these, I take a radon measure, you look at these, you know, you see what's happening here. Let's think, let, let's forget the CI. You look at the measure of the ball. Well, this should be going to zero somehow. How do you know that you can cook up a CI that makes this thing converge, okay? And to something that's not zero. Because if I allow zero, then it would be very easy, but I want somebody who's not zero and who's right on, okay? Um, so that's part of price. Price showed that if you have a radon measure at almost every point, you have some tangents, okay? We will actually look at a better case than that, um, but, <coughs> but first let me give you some examples. And these examples you know. So, examples. And of course, the first example is very trivial, but if you have never seen a tangent measure, you might be thinking, what on earth has she come and cook up here? Okay, so let's take A, any subset of Rn, Borel, of course. Everybody's Borel, the measures are Borel, the sets are Borel, you know, it's uh, And we look at mu is Hn restricted to I. That this is a Radon measure, Okay. Do you have a guess of who these guys are? Who are the tangent measures to these guys? So let's think for a minute what we're doing. What we're doing is we enlarge the ball, we look finer and finer, and here the set we're looking at is perfectly flat. What do we see? The Lebesgue measured of the thing. So in this case, tangent of mu at A is, and the C's, you realize, if I get a sequence that converges to something that's not zero, I put any other positive constant, I have another tangent measure. I never said these guys were unique in any sense. So the C, HM restricted to Rn. I know I'm being super pedantic here. For any C positive, 
and this is heard almost every A in A. Okay? And the same thing happens similarly. Let's take F, be a Borel measure locally integrable. And one log in Rm. And now let's take mu equals, let me too, so that we don't, A to be mu of, uh, mu of B to be the integral of F dx over B. OK? So in this case, the tangent of mu tilde A is the same thing. This is by Lebesgue differentiation theorem. It's positive for mu tilde almost every x. Okay? Yes. And no, I should, to be very precise, for almost every probably HM restricted to uh, almost every x in R. That's the correct thing without applying Lebesgue differentiation theorem. OK? Thank you. OK. So I won't do Giovanni's example, but let's for a minute go to a slightly more different. So let's take sigma to be an n-dimensional smooth submanifold of Rm. Okay. So that's for the differential geometries that like smoothness. Okay. So example two, let's take sigma and dimensional smooth. And I don't care if it's smooth, but it's to make you feel comfortable. And dimensional smooth submanifold. If you're doing differential geometry and you have a smooth submanifold and I ask you what's the tangent, you tell me, of course, the tangent plane. Okay? Now I am taking mu to be the volume. So it's mu equals the volume, on, which is roughly Hn restricted to sigma. And modulo the metric you choose, but let's assume this is a. And you look at who the tangents are. So. In this case, tangent of mu at A is nothing else than C, the H n measure restricted to the tangent plane to A at sigma. Because I'm always translating, I have to go to the origin. Uh, if this tangent plane, if you were putting your tangent plane on, on just on top of the set, And this is for, for every A and sigma. Here I don't need almost every because everybody's smooth. OK? OK. So as I said, Price, in part of his work, he proved that for a radon measure at almost every point, this is not empty. and. What um, I like to do this afternoon is prove the theorem that I'm going to use two minute, a minute and a half to state. So yes, for radon measures, but we're going to focus <coughs> not on all the radon measures. We're going to focus on a special type of measures. OK? So let me give you the last theorem. Yeah. No, 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 no. The CI is there for a very good reason. If I don't put the CI, all of them are converging to zero, provided I don't have, unless I have um, atomic measures. But okay, because yeah, if you correct, yes. So let me let me. The question was: Is this static? 
or or important. Let's let's for a minute think. Since and then don't worry, I'll state what I was going to state next uh, this afternoon. Let's remove the CI for a minute. Let's see what happens to any set. Actually, let's see what happens to any ball. If I don't T of A R I of mu of any ball is mu of B of A M of R I. And if R i is going to zero, unless I have an atomic measure, and by that means a Dirac at A, this is going to give me, this is becoming smaller and smaller. So what this shows is that the CI that we put here has to capture in some sense the speed at which the measure is going to zero. And because it has to do that, and it has to do that in every single ball, you realize, because this has to work for every compact set, and every compact set is roughly a ball, the measure has to have some properties. Because you imagine that there are measures where if, or it depends on the sequence, if you, it's going to depend on the sequence because some balls can be going to zero at one speed, the measure of some balls, and others at a different speed. So in fact, the question that the, the condition I'll put up on the board first thing tells us that if infinitesimally we have some sort of control on how the measures are going, the measures of balls are going to zero, then we have tangent measures. And that if we put a tiny bit more control, we have nice properties to the tangent measures. And then we will see how those conditions that I'm about to put relate to the condition that Price had. And we will go from there. So like having a relation between CI and RI may be something? Yes. It, but in some sense, more what you should think of CI, it has to do CI has to do is related in the case is related to the measure of the ball of center A and radius RI. Okay? And so yes, it, re it, it relates to RI, but it could be a very complicated relation that you don't know because we don't know at what speed. In general, you don't know at what speed the measure of the ball of center R uh, center of the ball of radius R is going to zero. Okay, you, you don't know that. Ah, okay. I see. So CI is here is one over the volume of the ball. Yes. And you will see that basically that's the only case where we can. I mean, of course, this is a very. This this normalizing factor works in lots of cases and in all the cases that you will see yes. in this course. Yes? Uh, what I'm considering is in this first example, uh, if you go on to the CI, do you not get the uh, complete menu for each I? No. No, because the CI I'm putting, think of the CI there is the same thing. The CI is 1 over the measure over the Lebesgue measure of a r i. And so you get that the measure of the unit ball is 1, but measure of bigger balls are bigger. OK? Yeah. Any other questions? OK, so let me leave it there, and I will start by talking about what could these mysterious CIs be. But you should be aware that when you have a radon measure, you can put different CIs, or so to speak, different CIs to get tangents where you to need them. Okay? Okay, thank you.